G'day, I'm Sean and welcome to the all new Car Expert podcast. Now today we've got a really big show for you. We're gonna be talking about the all new Toyota Parado that's just dropped, the new Triton that's just dropped and we've been driving the Tank 300 so we're gonna have a little bit of a chat about that. Now to help me get through the next half an hour, to help you get through the next half an hour, <laughs> I've brought along Car Expert's news machine, Jack Quick. And because we had cameras out and you can't keep them away from it, Paul Marek is joining us too. <laughs> Boys, welcome, welcome. How are you, Sean? Hello, Paul. Uh, Hello, Jack, this is your first time on the new Car Expert podcast. How are you feeling yeah. under lights? Yeah, pretty good. I suppose this is the first time a lot of people have seen my face and uh, might have heard my voice on the podcast previously, but you now get to see all of this. So yes. yes. So if you're not watching on YouTube, do head over to Car Expert on YouTube and watch the podcast. You get to see Jack, your life will be much better for it. <laughs> Paul, what have you been up to lately, mate? Um, I've just come back from Thailand, uh, so I was checking out the new uh, Mitsubishi Triton. Oh, it was a business trip then? Yes, okay, yep. <laughs> this time. Um, and then also uh, we've spent half the day filming content on the new Land Cruiser, or both new Land Cruisers, the 250 series and also the 70 series as well. So uh, some pretty exciting developments there from Toyota. Yes, it's been a busy week. So let's not waste time. Let's get straight into it. If you haven't already seen the news, head to carexpert.com.au and check it out. Uh, Toyota just announced the replacement Prado. It's better known as the Land Cruiser 250. And if you understand the Land Cruiser naming system, it falls between the 200 series and the 300 series, which is where they get that. The old one was called the 150. Let's not get bogged down in that. Let's get straight into it. It's got a 2.8 litre four cylinder turbo diesel with a mild hybrid, which is, it's sort of- Mild. Yeah, it's mild, mild. Yeah. yes. Very yeah. mild. It's, uh, we've talked about this recently with the new Hilux is getting a mild hybrid system. It sort of seems like a bit of a waste of time. Yeah, potentially. It's essentially the, the same engine as the previous generation uh, Prado with the 2.8, a four cylinder turbo diesel, but now just gets mild hybrid assistance, which is from my understanding with this particular system, just meant to help with like start stop. It will offer automatic like idle start stop and it will make that system and process a little bit smoother and easier. It's fuel saving essentially. Yeah, look, I, I think I, was, I love the look of the new Land Cruiser Prado. I think they've done a sensational job with the styling. A uh, little bit of sandy torp in there, throw yes. back to the 70 series. And in fact, they spent the first 10 minutes of the live stream talking about old cars and then spent about 10 seconds talking about the new one and we didn't actually get any information about it. Um, later on though, we did get information and part of that was that it's going to get the Hilux engine, which I think is a massive disappointment. They've not gone with a V6 diesel. There is no petrol option for Australia. They're getting the turbocharged four cylinder uh, petrol in the States with the hybrid out of the Lexus um, RX. I just think they've missed a big opportunity here. This is gonna be heavier as well. It shares a wheelbase and a platform with the 300 series. And I can't imagine driving a 300 series with a <laughs> cylinder. Yeah, so we recently did a tow test with the current model Prado, which has a 3,000 kilo tow capacity, yeah. and like it did the job, but it wasn't amazing. And the numbers on this are not amazing either. They're a 150 kilowatt, 500 newton meter, so it's not like a big jump up over the old one. The hybrid system's not giving it any kind of boost. Uh, I think in the States, they haven't actually given us Australian figures yet, so if you're wondering why we're a bit murky on that, that's why. Uh, in the States, it's rated to around a 2.7 ton tow capacity. Um, they have a different engine to what we're getting, but do you think that we'll, it'll be 3,000 kilos? That's where they're gonna try and yeah, get Yeah, I think their limitation is primarily due to that hybrid system, and I think it's actually a platform limitation. Uh, this platform is obviously 300 series, the new Lexus, uh, the GX, um, yeah. both uh, have V6 alternatives, mm -hmm. so. I, I think that I'm hoping that at some point they will drop a V6 into this or at least the, the hybrid petrol option, but it just seems, they do this all the time. Mm. They go so close to wowing us and then it releases and you're like, but who do? Mm. I think, I think <laughs> they're gonna try and force, they've gone with this four cylinder turbo diesel for now because the, the Lexus GX is launching um, with that cool twin turbo petrol V6, yep. which is what people want. And I think they've kind of, talked with each other and that's what they're thinking. They're gonna lead and push people towards, if you want the V6, well, you have no choice but to get the fancy Lexus. But that's a problem because that Lexus is expensive. Mm -hmm. In Australia, the 300 series is only available with the V6 diesel. They would be crazy to go and drop that V6 diesel into Prado because it's a ch meant to be a cheaper car. And the tech in Prado actually looks better than Land Cruiser as well. It actually has uh, sway bar disconnects, which we've seen previously on Wrangler and Gladiator. Um, and I think that they've ditched KDS 
process because this seems to achieve the same goal, but um, it seems to be a, a far simpler system. KDSS was quite complex uh, in a sense and, and heavy, developed in Australia as well, in Western Australia, which is kind of cool. But um, yeah, I'm excited to see it on the road here. Uh, it goes on sale in Australia, is it mid next year? Yeah, mid 2024 at this stage is when it's launching here. Yeah. And it'll be called the Land Cruiser in the States because they actually had the big boy Land Cruiser, but they killed it. Mm. And now it'll just be called the Land Cruiser in the States. So yeah, it's so. going to be Land Cruiser Prado in Australia, Land Cruiser 250 in Japan, and then also the Land Cruiser in the US. So That'll make that be, what you will. Interesting chat on the forums, on the Reddit forums for Land Cruiser pages. <laughs> um, it, look, it's a great looking car. It has elements from the Defender. It has elements from a 300 series. Um, like, okay, it looks better than uh, the new Everest, but oh, you'd be hard pressed to go one of these over the new Everest. When you well, it'll be expensive. Yeah. I guarantee it'll be expensive because Prado Kakadu caps out at like 95 grand. This, I think, mid spec will be about 95 grand. So it'll be significantly more than an Everest. But I don't know, I think this looks better than an Everest. Um, unfortunately, the engine means it, it probably won't be as capable, but um, you know, let's see. They also revealed the 70 series. Um, which was a bit of a surprise to all of us. Yeah. And I'm like, hold on, who went to AliExpress and put some lights on a 70 series? I'm like, oh my God, that's the actual design. It looks so goofy. I mean, I think I haven't grown up on a farm. Jack, you grew up on a farm too. Yeah. I think yeah. the lights are the, the smallest problem on the, the new Land Cruiser 70 series. I think the biggest issue is they cut an engine in half and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're saying they've now got a four cylinder Land Cruiser 70 with series. With an auto. With an auto. So yeah. they've taken the engine from the Hilux, much like the Prado, and they've stuck it in the 70 series mm -hmm. with a six speed automatic. Um, 150 kilowatts, 500 newton meters. Uh, is this the downfall of the 70 series? Yeah, well, I, although it sounds terrible, this, <laughs> this, the, the four cylinder makes more torque than the V8 does. Yeah. So theoretically, It'll be better to tow. It just mightn't sound as but good. I've got to say, uh, Matt, our commercial director, who's over there at the moment listening keenly, um, he's got a 70 series and the clutch is one of the limitations on those. If you go get an auto in a 70 series, uh, th they tend to be a bit of a monster because that, that V8 diesel is so underrated. Mm. And um, and I think Matt's about to go drop about 50 grand on his 70 series. I love that. Um, but yeah, I, I think this new one, the four cylinder does make a lot of sense, but the mishmash of components there kind of doesn't. So auto only for four cylinder, uh, diesel, uh, the V8 diesel will remain manual only. They've installed a new infotainment system that adds Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but no volume knob. So you've got buttons now for volume. Steering wheel's changed. Uh, it's got extra safety equipment and the, the goofiest of goofy headlights. Yes, so they've actually, you can see it if you're looking at the images uh, on our YouTube stream right now, you can see it does actually have a little radar sensor in the front, but no radar cruise control as far as we can tell. Maybe it's coming. Maybe it's this coming. This could be 2028. They go, hey guys, we're gonna spoil you, have some radar cruise control. I mean, to be fair, this is Toyota 70 series, so it could be 2048, yeah, and then they'll like, spoil us with that. How old would it be by that stage, God? <laughs> it was like 1985 when it was revealed, but I think the craziest part is um, with the change that the interior is virtually identical yeah. and sure it has this new infotainment system and uh, cluster and stuff but it has USB-C ports yeah. that I, I noticed. Know, that's which, fancy. Yeah whoop de doo I suppose yeah. but in, in an interior that has like velour seats yeah. and doesn't quite make sense. I've got a question for you guys. Uh, you both grew up on farms. Um, back where I grew up we drove Yugos and um, <laughs> <Lighters. laughs> fled wars and stuff. Um, on a farm why do farmers buy a 70 series like, what is the logic for someone who's watching this going, why would I spend 80 grand on that thing? Well, I hate to sound like a Toyota salesman, but they are just tough as hell. Mm. Um, I used to work in uh, underground mining and we all drove V870 series. Uh, there's a couple of six cylinders still getting around because they make them in South Africa. Yep. But the you know outside contractors would bring in Hiluxes and they'd fall to bits after a couple of months. And the Land Cruisers were easy to repair, easy to maintain. Um, you know, you recently tested the GXL single yep. cab. You pop that in low range, stick it in third gear, you don't have to touch the clutch or the yep. throttle all day. It'll just get itself around. I think they just go anywhere, do anything and tough as nails. I think part of it as well is, let me just put on my straight man hat for a second. It's just, um, 
the parts are like readily available. You can kind of travel around Australia and not worry too much. If something breaks, you'll yep. be able to go to the nearest town, whether that be yep. two hours or so away, and you'll be able to go to the mechanic and get parts. And it's just reliable, just that classic Toyota thing, I suppose. Well, would your people have um, worked on them on the farm instead of taking them to the dealer? Oh, the big ones, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you go out, out past Cobar, sort of way out in the outback, yep. they have mechan like, you know, farm hands that are mechanics as yep. well, and they'll just do all the servicing themselves. Yep. They'll go to the, the dealer in town, they'll order in the parts and they'll just do yep. it themselves. It's way easier, you know. It's, and everything's there, like you look at it, yep. you can see all the bits and pieces. The only thing that was a pain in the ass to do is the, the engine, yep. really. Mm. So, I don't know, I, yeah. I don't know, look, they'll probably sell them all. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, I think, actually, if you haven't watched the videos we've released on YouTube, uh, do click up here, you'll be able to see Paul's pretty face talking about the uh, the new 70 series and the new Prado. Uh, so, Paul, you've recently, as you said earlier in the podcast, you've just returned from Thailand yeah. and it wasn't a holiday. No, but it was hot and sweaty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, even in Australia, it's been hot and sweaty lately. Um, but you were driving the new, or no, you weren't actually driving, but you were checking out the brand new Mitsubishi Triton. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes. So I went to the reveal. It was a global reveal. Um, at first, we were at, uh, at this live stream and they had two of them there and I thought, oh, this is kind of a bit low rent. And then all of a sudden, this curtain dropped and they had what they were calling Triton World where they had all of these utes there. Walked out to have a look at the Triton and I'm like, oh, it's a TJM sticker on that. And um, I said to the Mitsubishi Australia people that were with me, I'm like, oh, it's good to see you guys got TJM involved in the you know prototyping process and stuff. And they're like, oh. <laughs> News to us, they were like, okay, and we contacted TJM. It was news to them as well. So TJM's tie division had come, it had been part of this prototyping process. And it's not like you can just go put a bull bar on a ute. You can, but it just might not last. You might have restricted airflow, etc. These guys had somehow done all the 3D uh, laser modelling to fit these things properly, um, but no one knew it was happening. But I've got to say that. Look, the design of the Triton, I wasn't a huge fan of, and design is entirely subjective. I just thought it looked a bit underdone. But some of the modified ones look sensational. Some of them had uh, camp kitchens on them, bull bars, off-road tires. Um, there was even like a slammed race that truck version, cool. which I thought was cool. Um, but key numbers there, it's, I, I it's just wonder if it's enough. Yeah. We know they've been testing this in Australia quite a lot. Um, we know Ranger was first announced nearly two years ago yep. with most of its specs available at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So just to fill you in, Mitsubishi's come out with a 2.4 litre twin turbo four cylinder. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that pretty much sums it up. Uh, and, and what else? <laughs> 150 kilowatts, 470 newton metres. Now that just doesn't seem like it's enough. Well, it's, it would be fine if it was maybe five years ago before there were V6 options uh, readily available, uh, before we knew that Toyota was considering going down the path of their hybrid drive trains and potentially something a bit meatier as well. Rear drum brakes, um, yeah, it's just a bit of a bit of an underwhelming thing, I reckon. Yeah, Ranger is 500, uh, Hilux is 500. Um, we recently did, again, we mentioned before the toe test, uh, we did Ute toe test uh, earlier in the year and Triton was right up on the weights and right up at the, like, sort of the edge of its limit with yeah. it. But it had a lower tow capacity then and now they've upped it to three and a half tonne. And you spent some time in the old um, Triton, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, it was meh. Like it's, yeah. it sorely needed a V6 because I know the Ranger's 600 Newton meters is very, very well appreciated and I'd love to see that in the Triton, but unfortunately, it doesn't really seem to be the case at launch anyway. And we just get this bi-turbo thing that is just, I and suppose that. Let's caveat this by saying we haven't driven it. Yep. But um, look, I, I think that knowing Mitsubishi, um, I'm hoping that it feels better behind the wheel. I had a sneaking suspicion that D-Max was underrated in terms of the power and torque figures. And I suspect this will be the same. If they've twin turbo charged this now, it probably is making a bit more than 470. Um, the good news though, they, they used to have a, a couple of issues when people were fitting camper vans and stuff because the rear axle was a little too inward of the chassis rails and was causing them to bend. Mm -hmm. So they've actually extended the wheelbase now, which means um, you're getting uh, better load distribution on the sh chassis rails. One thing that Ford and Toyota have done in, in the new Ranger and also the Rogue has moved the dampers outboard of the chassis rails. Mitsubishi's stuck with inboard and the outboard arrangement gives you um, better, better packaging, but also better handling uh, for, for the wider 
data track set up mm. that they have. So I'll be interested to see how this performs because uh, it is actually fitted with um, the active yaw control, uh, which is the, the torque vectoring system that uses brakes that we've seen on Outlander and um, was developed for the Evo. So, mm. hey, maybe this will be a race car or yeah, something. Well, they do have a uh, Dakar spec version or rally yeah. spec version of this yeah, thing. Yeah, that looked um, unreal. So, you know, I mean, look, it's coming out with, the initial offering's pretty good. They've got a dual cab offering, they've got a club cab, which is sort of like a super cab with a rear bench seat in the back. Uh, they have kept super select. Yes. Um, it's, it's like a reasonable offer. Like the, the yeah. current gen's a reasonable off-roader, right? Yeah, so if, for those that don't know, what that means is it's like a full-time four-wheel yep. drive system where it allows you to be in four-wheel drive while you're driving on uh, sealed surfaces, unlike the part-time four-wheel drive system that is also available on the Triton on the, the lesser grades. Yep. Yeah, and that actually makes it unique as well because I think it's um, Ranger in V6 trim that does uh, a 4A. Um, so I think that they've really uh, thought about that. It's a point of difference. And look, if this is priced well, I don't think it's actually the end of the world that it doesn't have all of the big numbers because it, as long as they don't try and compete with the big boys in terms of pricing, where you can't deliver in terms of what they have, um, then I think it'll be okay. Um, I'll just be keen to see where they price it because uh, the, the Chinese Utes are very cheap. They're now getting pretty good as well. So this really needs to be in that middle band. They can't just go too crazy with it. D-Max, BT50, the like, I imagine, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they've got the interior. They've put uh, it's basically the screen out of the Outlander yeah. into it. So it's got a new infotainment screen, um, digital the elements. Dash in cluster is from the Navara, though. Ah, I don't know right. If you notice that, you've got analog gauges and um, a screen in the center, which is from the Navara, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. um, but the Outlander has a full, full digital display, so they had that available to them. Yeah. Um, and they also surprised us by saying that at the moment there is no partnership with Nissan to develop a Navara off this platform. Oh, that's the complete opposite from what I'd heard. We heard that from Kato-san, who is the, the global boss of Mitsubishi. So we were taken aback by that because our understanding was that this would spawn the Navara platform, yeah. but he's saying at the moment. But I, I think they say that because they probably you know, Japanese are a bit funny with that stuff. So mm -hmm. it probably will, but at this stage, they're saying this is an all new um, platform, new engine, and all unique to Mitsubishi at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, I know we saw a manual uh, in the tradie spec in Thailand. Is that coming to Australia? Uh, manuals will eventually come to Australia, but they will just launch with the premium grades. Thailand is actually, we did a factory tour as well. Thailand has already started production. They're getting deliveries immediately. Mm -hmm. They've bumped us to Feb next year for, for our arrival, even though we are the second biggest market behind Thailand and globally in Mitsubishi's portfolio, the most profitable. So it is interesting they're focused on Thailand. You would have thought they'd run them con concurrently because Thailand is typically a four by two high rider, low rider market, whereas we're four by four um, upper spec. So it is fascinating how that stuff works in the Mitsubishi world. <laughs> yeah, so if you are considering buying a new Triton between now and February next year, I recommend you head to Google and type in help me car expert. It'll take you to a special page. You'll see some pictures of Paul and he, well, he won't help you, but the pictures of him will help you guide you through. I'll be there in spirit. Yes, <laughs> that will guide you through the process of uh, finding a car, pricing it up, getting a really good deal on it. And then we can connect you to a wide range of dealers all over the country to help you find your next new car. So head to help me car expert on Google and uh, hopefully may maybe get yourself a really good deal on a, uh, Triton before they run out and mm -hmm. or maybe put in order for a new Triton it's up to you uh, so we'll move on to our final segment we're going to talk about the car that we've all driven recently yes, yes. Um, there was an announcement oh it was a little while ago now that the Chinese were going to make a Jeep basically more or less and it's finally arrived it's called the GWM Tank 300 it's got a fantastic name uh, it does do tank turns but not like a tank does tank turns. It's, just, mm -hmm. it's more like a Land Cruiser's. It's uh, like a special. GWM tank. Yes, does it's, tank yes. Turn. It's, uh, disappointingly, it wasn't the tank turn I expected it to be. <laughs> but it did come out. Uh, we we got it. It was it was very orange. Uh, it was actually very nice inside, which was yep. quite a surprise. And it had a punchy little two liter four cylinder turbo petrol engine. Um, Jack. I believe you had a bit of a spin in it over the weekend. Yeah, How I did. I, um, I did have a spin over the weekend and I, um, I parked it right up against my Jimny, which I thought oh. was a, a fair <laughs> comparison. Uh, 
I um, quite like the idea of stepping up to the to the Tank 300, given its extra size, extra power. Was it significantly bigger? Yeah, it, it felt like it looked huge in yeah. comparison, although my Jimny does have a lift, so it's yeah. almost the same height. But um, a few things that really stood out to me with the Tank 300 was how refined the powertrain was. It's little, the two litre four cylinder yeah. turbo petrol was great. I wasn't expecting that amount of zap and zing when I got on the, on the throttle. And then paired with the, the automatic transmission, I've driven a lot of uh, GWMs and Havels. I think for, for reference, the H6, it has a dual clutch transmission that's a little bit clunky, but this torque converter is just great and it gets the power to the is it road. A ZF? I don't know exactly. I'm not 100% certain. I think, I can't remember if it's an eight or a nine speed either, but regardless, it feels really nice to drive, at least on the road. I didn't get a chance off-road, but um, I imagine, I thought you, did you have a chance off-road? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll quickly, actually, you can Google this quickly while I chat about it, but I'm pretty sure it was a ZF from memory, yeah. but I found the same thing. It was really nice and punchy, uh, very refined, and for the price, uh, like forty six nine ninety for the entry level uh, jumps up to fifty nine ninety for the top spec, which was the one that we had. I thought it was incredibly well presented, um, and it drove surprisingly well. A lot of the time when we test these um, Chinese market cars, they'll come to Australia with some very random. Um, disappointing tyres that, that just make them not great in terms of handling. Generally, the suspension isn't very good. This, on the other hand, the ride was actually quite well sorted. The handling was surprisingly good. So they have put a lot of effort into this. Where it did fall down though, we did a, a brake test from 100 k's an hour. And during that emergency stop, we measure the stopping distance and the time it takes to get from 100 to zero. When we played back the footage, and I felt in the car that it felt a bit weird, but when we played back the footage, it actually left the ground slightly at the rear. So the ride is a bit too soft at the rear for, for what it's trying to achieve. We've sort of brought that to the attention of uh, GWM, we'll see what they say. But um, off-road it was great. Front and rear diff locks, which is what you get on a, on a Raptor. Low range, you have stacker driving modes. Unfortunately, most of the drive modes only work in uh, low range, which kind of makes them a bit yeah. sort of pointless. Um, but I thought that it was quite impressive in terms of how it did everything and the tank turn function was, was kind of fun as well. Yeah, I mean, the numbers on it are pretty good. It's 162 kilowatts. 380 newton meters. Um, it, yeah, it went really well. It, aside from it d d trying to do a mono, um, <laughs> it, it actually stopped in a pretty reasonable distance. Like yeah, it, it was you know, fine. If was... you had it loaded up, it probably yeah. wouldn't have that issue as much, to be yeah. fair. Um, but you know, it's probably one of the surprising cars, that one of the Chinese market cars we've driven recently. That's it's actually sort of good. Yeah. <laughs> And I, say it. I found a lot of like interesting things. I spent different points throughout the week driving the car and I'd find a new feature and a new trick every time I, I drove the car. Admittedly, a lot of it was tucked in the, the touch screen. So I'd like open a new menu and oh, yeah. well, I can adjust this. Like I found out you could do, you could I had a heated steering wheel. I found that out and you could program one of the steering wheel buttons to make that turn on and off. And there was even like this special, in the boot, there's a special, uh, you lifted up the flap and you could erected like a table yes. of sorts and Isn't had like little poles. It was really interesting. I've, I've made like a little reel that I'm going to post on Instagram at some point, but like you click it into the, to the load floor cover and then you can put it on the ground and it's this awkward like 30 centimeter height off the ground. I don't know what it's use. for gymny owners. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a giant <laughs> table from a gymny owner. <laughs> Pop the gymny up and work on it. <laughs> I imagine it's for potentially like having a, a something for the spare tire to put it on or I don't know exactly but I, I in the packaging it said it can hold up to 60 kilos oh. so that's interesting do with that yeah, what you in, will. in the menus as well there was actually a off-road cooling function as well yes. so you press that and it'll run the uh, the engine fan so that if you are driving off-road it can actually keep everything cool because that's an issue we had with the Prado once where we're doing sand driving and the transmission overheated um, so that was uh, a generation ago but um, that's been fixed since then but it's one of those things where those functions actually come in handy um, I, th I thought that uh, a couple of random things like the stop start system would turn the headlight lights off very briefly and that was getting annoying because if you're driving home at night and stop start traffic people just kept 
thinking you were flashing them um, with, with the headlights. The lights, yes. And um, towing capacity was a little under as well. I mean, they want to be a competitor to the Prado, but in terms of towing capacity, it was 2,500 kilos. So 500 down on Prado, a ton down on a lot of the other sort of bigger SUVs in the segment. So, uh, but I think it's a great start. There is a hybrid coming and uh, there's an even bigger, this is the 300, was it a 500 or something? Yep. They have? Yeah, yeah, and that's meant to be the proper Prado rival right. from my understanding. This is like the uh, budget Wrangler, essentially. Oh, yeah. Um, this might be a contentious thing to say. I feel like it was a much better vehicle overall than a, a new Wrangler is in yes. terms of well, the steering how it wheel. Um, it seems actually it's connected to the, the vehicle, yeah. yes. um, which was <laughs> yeah. positive, not just the wind. Yes. Yeah. Um, it did also have a cool little mode called Car Expert Mode, so we'd like to thank GWM for fitting that to the car. We we did appreciate what that. What was that mode? Uh, it was it, you basically put it into Car Expert Mode, and then you oh. could select some settings. Oh ec- yes, I remember that now. Yes. There you go. Sorry, that was Sean being funny. Good, um, good job, Sean. Yes. Yeah. I'll take, well done. Oh, Jeremy, I'll take my payment uh, in crypto. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> An idea, mate. <laughs> Ask me how I know. <laughs> We'll skip over that today. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, so the Tank Ultra, uh, GWM Tank 300 Ultra that we drove, uh, $59.90, really, really good price compared to pretty much anything else that's... Almost the price of a Jimny at this stage. Almost the price of the Jimny. Um, (laughs) Actually, uh, I'd be curious to to put it head to head with the Jimny off-road and see how it goes. Especially when the five door arrives, uh, because that's going to be... As is oh very slow. <laughs> yes, I mean you, oh, yeah, you, you go off road, but yeah, this this thing was incredible off road. Like it just it just did it, which I guess there was some doubt for for us for Paul and I when we went and filmed it. We were a bit unsure whether it would, but uh, it did it. You know, if it, if it struggled, you pop it into low range, and then it just totaled off even on the road tires it was on. I'm interested um, if you're watching this or listening to this. If have you bought one? What's it like? Uh, I know a couple of people have started posting some stuff on the internet, videos and stuff, and um, Facebook seems, groups are going off. Yeah, it seems like people it. are liking them. I'm yeah. curious to see how this goes long term. Um, it's been out now for a couple of years, I think, in China. Um, so I'll be curious to see how it goes longer term here in Australia. Yeah. So if you haven't seen the video, do head to the Car Expert YouTube channel. We'll put a link in the description of the podcast so you can go and check it out. Uh, Paul driving the Tank 300, uh, doing some stunts in it <laughs> and driving off road. Uh, so, gentlemen, I'd like to. Uh, I should also mention it does burnouts. It it did. Yes, it <laughs> did. I did a burnout in it just for fun. Yeah, it, it was did impressive. a surprisingly good burnout. Um, Yes, uh, I suppose yeah, they just need to fit a line lock function. And yes, and the go. diff worked after it, and the diff which was worked good. After it. Yes. So go, go GWM. Yes, what, 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 what was the car that had diff problems, Paul? Uh, my Raptor. Oh, that's right, it was your Raptor, yes, I remember. Uh, we also have a video of that on YouTube if you haven't seen that. <laughs> Love that's, the it's a very, very good video to watch. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to thank you guys for joining me. We're going to wrap it up here this week. Any final thoughts you want to leave us with before we go? No, mate, thank you for the jokes. No, and thank you for having me, Sean. It's nice to make my debut in person. Yes, yes, in, in uh, 4K. So, yeah, God. So if you are listening to this podcast, uh, I do make a request. Go over to YouTube and, uh, and watch it. You know, it's very fun. We've also got great images of the cars, uh, video footage, so you can actually get a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, if you are on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a like, leave us a comment. If you're listening on one of the many podcast platforms we're on, Uh, Do leave us a rating and a review. Uh, Five stars would be much appreciated. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, we'd love to hear them. We'd love any suggestions you have. So you can email us, uh, podcast at carexpert.com.au. Next week, we're going to be talking about the new Gran Turismo movie. We're all off to see that uh, very shortly as a a little team outing. Uh, And we're going to be talking about the new Mustang. One of our guys, Scott Colley, if you remember from last episode, he went to the States to drive us. He's going to tell you all about it. He's very tall. I don't know how he fit. Yes, well, you know, Everything's, everything's bigger in America, I guess. <laughs> so I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this week, and we will see you next time.